Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, a podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Together, Jake and his friends interview talents varying from actors, directors, writers, producers, composers, puppeteers, and so much more. Who will they be chatting with today? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. What's going on, you guys? Welcome to another episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. I am one of your co hosts, Chris Bixby, and with me today, our other co-hosts, Wyatt McCullough and Matt Bingle, and our host, Jake Deffenbaugh. How are you guys? Doing really good. great. How, How are you, Chris? How are you doing? Very Ooh. good. Who we got Very today, good. Chris? Well, today we have someone who a lot of Nickelodeon fans will know as the creator of the show Chalk Zone. Mm-hmm. He has also worked on shows such as Cow and Chicken, Curious George, and many other things. And here he is, Bill Burnett. Bill, how are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you guys doing? Great. Very good. I'm great. Thanks for asking. You're very good. So to start this off, we know who you are, but for those who don't, would you care to introduce yourself a bit? Well, my name is Bill Burnett, and uh, as was just said, my biggest claim to fame is that I was the co-creator and executive producer of Chalk Zone, which was yeah. one of uh, Nickelodeon's biggest hits back in the in the early part of this century, and. Uh, uh prior to that i was the creative supervisor creative producer on uh on a show on anthology show called oh yeah cartoons which is what came out of and i created about 10 shows for that uh which was just a great experience you know with Uh uh, so many great people uh, you know, a, a lot, you know, Butch Hartman and Robin Zetti yeah. and uh, Carlos Ramos uh, all came out of that same thing. Uh, and um, and before that, I was the uh, head writer of Cow and Chicken. I, I, I sort of helped David Feast figure out how to make Cow and Chicken into a series. He had made one short, which was a very bizarre if you're familiar with cow and chicken at all, it was that kind of bizarre humor. Yeah. But it was, uh, it was, it left things. For instance, the mom and dad uh, were revealed at the end of the first pilot episode to just be legs, you know, sawed off at the top, the (laughs) camera. Yeah. And, you know, they had been legs uh, uh, all the way through with the audience sort of anticipating, oh, this is that that uh, trope where you see people's legs, you know, you know, but the people are there. But uh, you know, it was just like they were tree stumps. <laughs> so that obviously that wouldn't play, uh, or or it would be very difficult. It would be very difficult to constantly, whenever mom and dad did anything, that they were just legs, and. Um, so anyway, before that, I was the uh, creative director of um, of Hanna Barbera, which meant oh, that nice. I, uh, yeah, I was I oversaw all the um, development and uh, and and marketing. You know, uh, getting the word out about all these amazing. We we were making Powerpuff Girls, uh, uh, Dexter's Lab. Um, uh, you know, uh, Johnny Bravo, Scooby Doo, uh, whatever. Yeah, it was a, a a real a real rebirth of uh, TV animation happening right there. You know, in real time, it was it was pretty amazing. TV animation had gotten pretty moribund at that time. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Before that, I was the uh, creative director of MTV Networks Advertising Agency. Uh, uh it was really a kind of a think tank that made up uh interstitial type programming uh and uh, in the form of ads i mean it they they served the function of ads in the sense that they told you um that shows were going to be on but they were uh, very funny very satirical uh most of them and um and so my clients were mtv nickelodeon nick at night uh vh1 and comedy central and i made up the name comedy central and wrote the original positioning paper for that so that's kind of a a little feather in my cap i feel like 
Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> awesome. Um, so can you talk about, about your background, how you grew up? Well, I grew up in, uh, in northern New Jersey, uh, uh, sort of a hinterland of New York, uh, bedroom community. Uh, it's funny, I was just looking at uh, pictures of my, my town, how it developed, and it was actually a very rural town, very uh, agrarian. Um, yeah. But when, by the time I was living there, I was lucky enough to live in a in a rural around in, in a part of the town that maintained that, um, you know that sort of bucolic uh, thing. I, I grew up with a pond a hundred yards away that I could skate on and that I could, you know, and uh, trails and woods and apple trees and. You know, it was uh, and I, at night the place came alive with with, with Katie did, Katie did, and Katie did, Katie did. You know, <laughs> it was like this amazing place. And um, but most of the town was was bedroom communities for uh, mostly New York or Newark, and. Um, and uh, so, you know, I had a kind of bucolic, idyllic childhood in a way. Probably, I probably have the best childhood of almost anybody I know. You know That's awesome. People get uh, jealous of my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so, so what got you into writing and producing? Well, I wanted to be a writer from the earliest time that, uh, you know, that's the sound that comes on whenever you say the word writer. Um, from, from the earliest moment that I realized that there were people who were writers, meaning when I was like six years old, I, uh, you know, it, it dawned on me, oh, wow, all these stories and things that I've been looking at, poems, humor, that I've been enjoying has are written by somebody, and it's and it's a proud, uh, you know, tradition. It's a it's an occupation, and so I started writing absolutely everything um, that could be written. I wrote plays and novels and short stories and TV shows and scripts and uh, poems and humor pieces and essays, and uh, I got a couple published. Uh, at an early age, um, but n nothing really to speak of. And uh, well, then when my parents got me a, um, a guitar, they, they went to Mexico and they came back with a guitar. And um, I thought that was amazing because mm -hmm. I hadn't asked for a guitar. I didn't know that what I wanted to do was play guitar. It was a nylon string from Mexico. It was pretty darn good too. Wow. I don't know how they managed. Oh, to nice. Do it. And um, so I just kind of fell on that guitar and started writing songs, um, which, as you know, as fans of any of my work that I just took you through, I, uh, songs play a big part in every one of those uh, things, and particularly in Chalk Zone. Chalk Zone, I, I wrote probably about 300 songs for all together. Oh, wow. wow. Uh, so uh, then, you know, I went through a decade of starving artists and, uh, you know, I did lots of things. I portrayed the folk singer Phil Oaks in a movie about Phil Oaks and in a play about him. And I, and I uh, produced uh radio advertisements for for companies that were making them and i uh i was a, a classic folk singer wandering around greenwich village playing at club wa and uh you know uh all that stuff and um then i um uh, the starving part was true yeah <laughs> It's starving for a very long period of time is a big bummer, you know? I mean, it has its uh, bohemian uh, charm, 
Mm-hmm. But it gets really tiresome. And people kept saying to me, people who I, who I would do those radio uh, things for, they would say, hey, you know, you're pretty good at this. Uh, why don't, you, if you ever want to get into advertising, let us know. We'll help you get into advertising. And I would be like, no, no. Uh, you know, I felt that advertising was selling out. You know, it was terrible. And, um, but then round about when I was around mid thirties, I woke up, had an, a kind of epiphany of this is, this sucks. I'm just being a person who works at video stores or, you know, little tiny jobs that, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, uh, I went in. I went in from the cold and discovered, to my astonishment, that uh, everything that I wanted to do became possible by going into advertising. I went. I when I went in. First of all, the 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 bare thing that you did, the basic thing that you did as an advertising guy, was write stories. Really, I mean, you're writing little stories and you're making up pieces of music and you're performing, you're getting up in front of people and selling them the, those ideas. And then you're making them, you're producing them, you're learning about produ- production, putting them on TV. Some of them are funny, you know, and, uh, and that led me to become a Fred Allen, which was, you know, this very, very hip, uh, unusual advertising agency that, uh, that really made programming for MTV and Nickelodeon. You know, it was that was what it did. So, um, so I achieved everything that I that my were my dreams by going in the opposite direction of what my th- I thought my dreams were, and and even doing something that I thought was anathema. You know, I thought it was. Uh, what sellouts do, you know? So that's my advice to all you young people out there is don't necessarily ram your head into the brick wall of the thing that you think you want to do over and over again and be disappointed. You know, maybe there's another way that to go to what you want to do that, you know, might even be embodied in like the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So get into those fields. Who were some of your inspirations? My inspirations uh, yeah. as, as just a general artist, you mean? Yeah. Like writing and producing. Um, Shel Silverstein is an inspiration. You know, he was a, a multi... Uh, what's that word? Uh, polymath. You know, is that the word? That's something. Yeah, I, no, I never heard that word. Heard that word, but the, anyway, he drew and wrote bizarre things that kind of passed for children's books. And you know, are you familiar with Shel Silverstein? Any, I think. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I mean, well, he sounds familiar. He's somebody to check out. You know, and uh, of course. Uh, all the great, you know, I mean, Mad Magazine. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, R. Crumb, um, Lewis Carroll. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, you know, you can't list the influences and inspirations without a big chunk of it being the Beatles. You for know, sure, right? yeah, that's right. for sure. That's awesome. Um, you know, I could get more arcane if you want me to. Sure, uh, go ahead. Sure, uh, go ahead. Uh, well, Robert Benchley was a big. Uh, you know, he was a humorist in the in the twenties and thirties, and he wrote for the New Yorker, and he was a absurdist. Um, he wrote humor pieces, little little humor pieces it's a it's an it's a almost almost lost art the only person sort of keeping it up are people like 
Borowitz on the in the New Yorker, except that Borowitz is always doing satire based on what's going on in the headlines, you know, and eventually was just floating free. You know, he would just write silly stuff that had no connection to anything in the world. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, the Incredible String Band is right. a big, big influence, you know, uh, difficult uh, taste to develop. Not everybody has it. It's, uh, yeah. you know, it's yeah. the ultimate cult group from the 1960s, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice. Right. So now, um, one of the earliest projects you worked on was a series of short musicals for PBS titled Hip Pocket Musicals. Could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, that was a great idea that me and my buddies had. Um, that uh, the idea would be, you know, Saturday Night Live was still new. It was uh, still only a couple of years old. Mm-hmm. And in Saturday Night Live, what you have is an ensemble group uh, in those days, made up of John Belushi and and uh, uh, Gilda Radner and Lorraine Newman, and you know, and th- they would always in this sketch they would they they would be this group of characters, and then in the next in the next sketch, the same people would be in another group of characters, and you know, so we thought let's take that basic idea and make a series that is a repertory company where the most wonderful actors play in every sh- every story, but they play different parts and they're half hour long. So they're short musicals. They get beginning, middle and end within 30 minutes. And uh, um, so we wrote three. Uh, one was called uh, uh, Love Cycle, a soap operetta, which was oh, a nice. haunted ghost story. In uh, in uh, a laundromat, a laundromat was haunted by the ghost of a woman who had died in a freak dryer accident, and okay. she was there with her unresolved business of needing to confront her ex husband who who came to the laundromat to um, to do his laundry. So you know um, that was the that was the the first one, and then we wrote one called Doomsday in Court which was about a, uh, a horror movie actor, sort of like, uh, like Bella Lugosi, uh, you know, or um, Christopher, uh, can't think of his name. Um, but you know, the, the Vincent Price. Uh, oh yeah. He was a well-known, a successful horror movie actor who had a girlfriend and, and was, they were breaking up and, so she was suing him for palimony, which was a, a big d- deal at that time. Pa- the, the term palimony, you probably haven't heard that. I've never heard anybody say it in the last couple of decades, but it was big back then when we were doing mm-hmm. this. And, uh, and then the third one was called I Love Lucia, which was a, about a tempestuous opera star who wanted to um, stop being an opera star and have a baby and her husband, the director of the opera didn't want her to have a baby. And so there was, there was conflict. And um, the first one, uh, the soap operetta um, became the pilot and we actually produced it with uh, Patti Lapone and uh, Martin Vidnovic and Priscilla Lopez and uh, uh, Ellen, Oh gosh, this is this is actually early in the morning for me, so I uh, forget names sometimes. But uh, Foley, Ellen Foley, um, and uh, a bunch of really great people. Uh, Walter Bobby was uh, in it, and these these are people who almost every name every involved with that pro- project turned mm-hmm. out to be a big name, you know, I and mean, went on to do things very significant things and um you know uh, patty lepone the queen of broadway you know so yeah uh, so we made that half hour uh show 
unfortunately it, it, be, it fell into that category of interesting failure. <laughs> it, it has really good things about it. Um, uh, most people agree that who see, you can find it. It's called, um, it, it, I think it's listed under its title, which is uh, 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 Love Cycle, Love Cycle, colon, a soap operata. And uh, it is hmm. around. If you probably, if you Google Patty Lapone short musical or something like that, you could probably find it that way. Um, yeah. I wrote the music and lyrics and co-wrote the story. Uh, David Mish wrote the script. Peggy Soylent also was my partner on the, on my side of it. And we did everything together. She mm -hmm. deserves a lot of credit. And then, then it's got some really nice stuff. It really does. But nice. uh, it didn't, awesome. uh, I, I, I still, you know, it's one of those, it's, one that got away, and uh, I feel bad that uh, you know. I, I wish we could go back and revisit it. It's not really plausible, um, but it was a good idea. I think it would have. I think on Netflix now to have, uh, or you know, what Netflix represents of the streaming world, um, to have short musicals where the same wonderful actresses and actors show up this time as, you know, the district attorney and that time as the murderer. And this time, you know, it would be so cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. So in the, in the animation world, uh, you were the head writer for Cow and Chicken. What was it like working on that? Oh, well, it was great fun. I mean, David Feast possibly the funniest man I've ever worked with. Yeah. He just had a, a bizarre take on things that, uh, that would turn out to work. You know, I say he would pitch these stories like uh, the episode where cow, who basically is a little girl cow is, you know, about six years old or something in, in terms of, but she's gigantic, of course. And uh, she's playing um, a game of tossing her, her, uh, her uh, uh, uncle, I think he's her uncle, boneless chicken. <laughs> she's tossing him. She's <laughs> playing a game, tossing him around and tosses him too far and he lands on the roof. <laughs> and, <Yeah. laughs> So, you know, this is going to be really bad because the sun's beating down on him and he's just, he's boneless. So he can't, he does not, he's a disabled person, really, when you come down to it. Yeah. And he, mm -hmm. So she gets a ladder and goes and climbs up on the roof to rescue him. And the ladder, of course, falls over. And now the whole rest of the show is played like like people who have been trapped on a desert island and there's no way we're going to die you know no one's going to rescue us you know and as they're just on the roof you know yeah yeah <laughs> and when when david pitched that a bunch of us said how are we going to make that into an episode that's this it's just it goes nowhere they're just stuck on a roof but it was very very funny yeah. <laughs> that's funny <laughs> I did a um, a uh, musical, two part. You know, it was two. Uh, I guess they were seven minute episodes. Uh, uh, so fourteen minute musical called um, "The Ugliest Weenie." <laughs> and, uh, it was uh, it was really good. It was up, up for an, an Annie Award and uh, oh it, wow! Definitely one of, and I also awesome. I wrote. The only um, show that was banned from Cartoon Network, I think maybe the only one ever, but certainly the only one from that series, which was called Buffalo Gals. Uh, oh, wow. It was perceived as a, um, as a thinly veiled uh, 
thing about lesbians. I, when, uh, I was not writing about lesbians. I didn't. I didn't across my mind that I was writing about lesbians. I, I just thought I was writing about large women who would take a shine to cow because she's a large female. You know, she's big, and they're big, and uh, that they would want her to be in their club. You know, um, and they wouldn't want chicken to be in their club. Uh, because he's a scrawny little male, you know, and they want yeah. big females. <laughs> so what it came out as is uh, it began to look like you know, it, it was a, because they became the villains who were who were uh, mis misusing uh, Cow's brother. And she got mad at them because they were being mean to chicken. And uh, so it ended up looking like some kind of diss of lesbians. I, I don't, I, I don't, uh, I, I see how people see that now, but I, when I was making it up, it was just a funny idea. You know? uh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So um, now, of course, we talked about it in the beginning, but in 1998, you created the first of many OEA oh yeah, cartoons shorts on Nickelodeon called chalk zone which you know of course became its own series so how, how did that idea kind of come about of chalk zone well it was that, that that actually the idea for it actually started back at hanna barbera there was a big migration that happened because when ted turner sold hanna barbera and everything he sold everything to warner brothers and so warner brothers being warner brothers you know the, the, that's like the biggest animation yeah the world yeah. they didn't need uh what we were doing at hanna barbera that you know they if they were going to continue doing anything with hanna barbera characters and stuff or they were going to run it you know they weren't going to have us guys run it and so we all moved over to nickelodeon where fred had pretty deep connections mm -hmm. and, uh, and um uh, Chalk Zone was an idea that, you know, Fred wanted me and Larry Huber. Larry Huber was running the show over at Hanna-Barbera in terms of producing all of those many cartoons. Fred's, just very quick, Fred's modus operandi is to get a lot of people who want to create a lot of short cartoons, like uh, 39 short cartoons instead of just doing um, like four or five and and nursing them and nursing them and hoping that they, we've chosen the right ones that are going to be a hit do around 40 of them and get get them all made well and see who salutes see, see who the audience likes you know, the, you can tell by focus groups and you can tell by ratings on the TV that this show is really liked. People want to see more of that one. That was very funny. It made them laugh. So um, Fred wanted me and Larry to make one of the one of those shows. And we started. So we got together and we said, uh, so what what's your uh What's your interest, Larry? I, I didn't know Larry at all. You know, I mean, I knew he was there. But, and Larry said, well, I've always wanted to, you know, Larry's an artist. I'm not an artist. I'm a idea guy and a writer and a musician. Um, and I can have artistic ideas. You know, I can say, I could draw a little sketch that kind of gives somebody the idea of, oh, yeah, oh, I get it. I, that, that could be like this. And then a real artist does it, you know. So Larry's thing was he wanted, he liked uh, like things like Harold and the Purple Crayon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 He liked, because what he liked about it was that the kid in Harold and the Purple Crayon was able to make things that really came into life mm -hmm. with art he could draw in them in the yeah. air and things would you know now Har harold right. and purple crayon was very very uh 
preschooly, you know, very yeah. little kid. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. And uh, we weren't interested in doing a preschool show. Uh, and, and Fred was not interested in us developing preschool shows. So that was, so I came up with the corresponding idea, the sort of second half of the idea of, well, suppose this kid who can do things draws in chalk and suppose there's a world on the other side of the chalkboard where everything that's ever been drawn in chalk and erased comes to life and lives forever with the soul that the artist intended for it, you know? Yeah. So that became, you know, I was always interested in things like uh, the Wizard of Oz, uh, yeah. uh, yes. uh, the, Through awesome. the Looking Glass, the Phantom Toll Booth, you know, things that were about other worlds, our to- alternative universes, you know, where things were bizarre, you know. And uh, so we developed this idea. And when we went to Nickelodeon, we put it into production. And we were lucky to have Carlos Ramos, who was just an amazingly talented guy, do the designs and the original storyboards. And it came out just beautiful. And, That's, um, nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, if you ever get a chance to just go back and look at that original seven minute pilot cartoon, it's, it's a, it's a wonder. It, know, is definitely. I mean, it, really, it definitely is. We introduce a new idea that there is a magic chalk that it takes you through into this alternative universe that there are monsters there that, have been drawn by Rudy or, you know, that come to life. A a monster chases Rudy. Rudy meets his old friend Snap and and a couple of other drawings that he did. Yeah. And uh, the chase results in uh, getting back into the real world and and defeating the monster. And it's all in like seven minutes. All, All of that happens in seven minutes and it feels very comfortable. It definitely does. It's an amazing show. All right. So, um, what was it like working with uh, cast and crew for the first time? Cast and crew? Yeah, mm-hmm. I've talked yep. to yep. orga- well, with that cast and crew. I thought you meant the uh, the company that sends me my checks intermittent. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard the answer to that. You can answer that also. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was very exciting. I, I, it was by the, you know, the, the whole uh, cow and chicken. And, and, you know, I was also serving a strange function back at Hanna-Barbera of being on Cow and Chicken and also being the sort of liaison who was supposed to, the interlocutor between the uh, network and the, and the creators. So if Dexter's Lab was doing something that the, the network thought was, uh, wasn't the right idea, that I was supposed to go and tell them what the network thought. And that m- meant that I was, you know, kill the messenger kind of thing, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, but um, so I, I got used to the whole thing of there's a cast and a crew and we do recordings and, uh, and we uh, over there as part of that. And then um, it was very exciting to um you know was we were occupying a little corner of the nickelodeon animation studio which was brand new we were the first people in there they they still were finishing putting in the toilets and everything you know when we moved in there oh wow and um and uh you know it was great uh, i loved being the executive producer. I think I was good at it. And I, I, uh, I would, you know, you have meetings with the whole you know, big meetings with everybody around a gigantic table. And there's a storyboard that covers all the walls of a very big room. And you take people through the storyboard and uh, I'm the guy to whom the storyboard is being pitched. You know, I'm the one who goes, along with Larry, it was me and Larry who were, uh, so that was, 
that was great. I I really feel um, suited to that role. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. Do you have a favorite Toxin episode or character? Well, you know, the, the Chalk's Out episode that I keep gravitating back to is a really, uh, it's the one where uh, uh, Miss Tweezer, the strange uh, reality-based uh, substitute teacher, uh, takes Rudy's, uh, stops Rudy from using his magic chalk and so he has a little chalkboard about this big. Oh, and, wow. And he can use the magic chalk to draw around the edges of it. And then he can see into chalk zone and move anywhere in chalk zone <laughs> by moving around in real world. And he can uh -huh. reach into chalk zone and affect things through the window. But he's, it's the window's too small for him to actually climb through. And so there's a plot going on in Chalk Zone and a plot going on in real world. And uh, I just love playing with that concept. You know, when I yeah. walk around, I see, for instance, I go to Trader Joe's and there's, uh, there's chalkboards with the special things up, you know, being, mm -hmm. and I think, oh, wow, Rudy could go through there or come <laughs> out in uh -huh. here, you know. And uh, anytime you see chalk, which is not that often these days, right? That, that's a way in and out of chalk zone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite character? Um. Well, you know, I'm I. I love Snap. Yes, yeah, Jamie Lott Milo does Snap. amazing. With oh her. wow! Oh yeah. <laughs> this nice. is one of the only toys oh, nice. ever made. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, Snap is funny and resourceful and wise guy. Yeah. Andy Milo did a great amazing job. job. Uh, but I, you know, I really relate to Rudy. Um, I feel that both Larry and I are a lot like Rudy in that we're uh, regular guys. Yeah. Who just want to do the right thing. And uh, we're not big show offs, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so, you know, a lot of a lot of our fellow cartoonists made fun of our show and Rudy because it was so earnest and because Rudy would solve a problem by drawing a ladder or drawing a rope or something, you know, that that seemed really they, they felt like, why doesn't he draw a, you know, supersonic uh jet that can fly in and all the way to you know and uh, mm -hmm. my answer to that was that allison is in wonderland if you have superman in wonderland it's really not it doesn't uh resonate. doesn't work out you know you right. need you need dorothy to be the every girl the every person who is astonished by everything and dismayed and uh indignant you know about things uh because that's how we would react you know yeah find yourself with a mad hatter at a mad hatter's tea party you don't want superman at the mad hatter's tea party <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely <laughs> definitely yeah. for sure yeah, oh, yeah. No. similarly do you have a favorite chalk zone song Mm. you know it shifts around uh uh i always enjoy when the scoochie corazon comes up oh the yeah corazon and jock zone the scoochie corazon yeah. um but uh you know i sing uh wait till the golden thumb comes up again i sing that in my shows uh oh, nice I sing, uh, I've been wishing for a magical breeze. Let it blow, let it blow my way. Which is, uh, it's a hard, that's a hard episode to find. But, um, but it's a good song. Uh, it was actually written 
I wrote that specifically for the storyboard artist who was going to do it because he was a wonderful storyboard artist named Barry Bunce. And, um, and Barry was just a great guy, very fun to work with, really talented. And, uh, and he got cancer. And it wasn't uh, it wasn't uh, looking good, and he was um, too weak to do uh, a full storyboard. Which uh, a full storyboard for a full episode of Chalk Zone would be probably about 160 pages long, with three drawings on each. And it's the job of the storyboard artist to basically figure out how he's the the storyboard artist is really like the first director. Mm-hmm. you know right because they're learning yeah. how everything's gonna flow you know and uh and so it's a big job long job arduous and barry didn't have the the choyuk to do that anymore and um but he did have the strength to do a a, a, a short one minute musical storyboard which is only about 50 pages you know three panels each and and it doesn't have to. It's not as arduous to figure out how the story comes together. It's a it's a music video, which means that you know, non sequitur is sort of part of the thing. So so I knew that he liked. Um, uh, I knew that he liked um, reggae. And, yeah. Uh, so I made up this uh, I'm on a I am wishing for a magical breeze let it blow let it blow my way the Indra, sir, see it swishing through the tropical trees let it blow let it blow my way let it blow my way Ooh, let it blow let it blow let it blow my way Ooh, let it blow my way. That's awesome. The ripple nice. moving over the pond. Wow. Let it blow, let it blow my way. Like a signal from the great beyond. Let it blow, let it blow my way. Let it blow my way. So uh, that was, you know, Barry liked that song and it gave him something that he wanted to get up every morning and do. And it was, uh, uh, and he, he did live uh, about 12 months longer than they said he was going to live. Maybe it was that, maybe it was that song. I don't know. But, um, but I like that song. Nice. Yeah. I also like, uh, uh, Flashlight. Mm, you know, yes uh, yeah <laughs> you know uh magic carpet ride you know i like all i love all those songs asking me what my favorite is is really difficult <laughs> yeah I, 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 really, I, I agree yeah they are all really good yeah they are mm-hmm. so so is there anything so here's an interesting question is there anything you would have liked to see rudy snap and penny do like an adventure that we didn't get to see in the series that you would have liked to see tons of them i yeah. i felt that we were just getting going i i really i know it chafes at me that we were cut off at 40 episodes when when uh you know the normal the the, the norm is like 52 episodes and mm-hmm. you know right, right. yeah Fairly Odd Parents went on for like yes. 120, 200 episodes. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, Great it, show. Uh, nothing. That is a good show. By the way, I made up the name Fairly Odd Parents, too. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, but, That's one uh, we never heard. <laughs> yeah, they were, they, they understandably didn't want to use the word fairy or God in the title. And it was originally, you know, the fairy godparents. That's the, that, you know, that's, that's the term, your fairy godparents. Yeah. And um, that was originally what he called it, fairy godparents. Um, so there was a quest for a, I, and I had had fairly odd parents 
rattling around in my trunk for years, waiting for some place for it to, you know, to be used. Mm -hmm. And so I, I basically just gave it to them. And um, there you go. For the first, if you if you were to look at fairly odd parents, you'll see. Thank you to Bill Burnett for the first couple of seasons, and then they just yeah said fuck it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um. Anyway, what you? Oh yeah. So you know, this has been this this idea has rattled around. Uh, I have a big. Where I wanted to go with uh, Chalk Zone was to just move things up a little bit to the next layer of what would naturally actually be Rudy and Penny's life experience, which would be, you know, going on to college or going yeah. into adulthood. Yeah, and, that would be cool. Mm-hmm. Would have been cool. <laughs> and, uh, and that there would naturally be a... Um, a lessening of of interaction with chalk zone because that's you know what you do when you you're a kid and you're going into the chalkboard and all that stuff. Yeah. So you know things would start to happen in chalk zone without Rudy. That would be pretty dark. You know that there would be another um, creator who had access to a magic chalk who came into chalk zone and. Uh, was b- being a malevolent ruler of chalk zone, forcing people to do things that weren't cool. And, um, and then that character would discover that if you stayed too long in chalk zone, you chalked up and you became, you lost your human flesh and bone, uh, ness and, uh, and became a chalk character. And that so that guy would uh, would need to journey need to get out of chalk zone. So he would need Rudy's help because Rudy would be the one who had the uh, the magic chalk that can get you in and out. He his magic chalk wouldn't work anymore as a way to go in and out of chalk zone, and yeah. and he would uh, need to journey in real world to a place where there would be. Uh, an elixir that would restore his humanness so that he could go back to, you know, and so it would be a kind of a big Uber story. Like you, like you find in X files and in, you know, where there's like individual up in X files, there's the story of Fox Mulder and his sister who got abducted and his belief in, Mm -hmm. um, uh, paranormal things based on that which and the smoking man and are you guys into x-files and all not or, really i uh, i have family members who are yeah okay well it's very it's very good it's actually stands up quite well it's still oh, yes. available. um very long running show yeah. yeah okay so think of any show that has a what i call an uber story you know where there's like individual episodes that they you know, I mean, are you familiar with the story of uh, of the uh, what the heck was it called? The guy, the doctor who kills his wife and uh, no, 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 I never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of the name of it right now, but anyway, uh, that's that's a, it's it's a, I mean, like. Uh, in Star Wars, there's uh, there's the individual things that they're doing right now, and then there's Darth Vader, and he's your father, and there's you know, right. there's a yeah. bigger <laughs> story that's floating along on top right. of the little stories that are you know that we've got to t- deal with this situation right now, you know, so like that. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, do you still keep in touch with anyone from Chalk Zone? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm on a pretty uh, regular working basis with Jeff Levin, who was the uh, the last of the three uh, 
composers for Chalk Zone. He and I are good friends and we work together on things. Nice. And, and also with Guy Moon, the one he, that preceded him. Uh, Our I, Guy Moon's awesome. I'm in touch with Guy Moon. And then Debbie Derryberry, who played uh, various roles. And, uh, and we had a um, 20th anniversary gathering. Yeah, he did. Like this. Um, and uh, E.G. Daly and Candy Milo and Robert Kate and uh, uh, Jess Harnell um, showed up and a lot of the artists showed up and directors and uh, uh, so it was you know I, all those people came and we laughed and you know we're happy to see each other um, I, I I admit I've lost touch with I'd like to be more in touch with Larry but uh there's no problem between us. It's just, uh, you know, life, life and life only. Life goes on. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you've, you've also written for the long run PBS kids series, Curious George. What was it like working on that? And do you have a favorite episode you've written? Yeah. Uh, it was fun. You know, that, that was a uh, preschool show. Yeah, mm -hmm. which meant it had a lot of um, restrictions. Yeah, you know uh, that you don't have on the uh, on the older shows. Uh, um, it was a, uh, it, but it you know there was it was a, a good a good kind of challenge, uh, and we managed to get some funny ones. Uh, I I. I particularly, you know, it's funny. I remember them the way they were written more than I remember, you know, because I didn't have much to do, unlike with Chalk Summer, I was involved with every little step. Yeah. Curious George, I just wrote the script. And once the script moved on to, you know, I didn't have anything to do with decisions about production or how, how it got edited or anything, you know, so. Um, but um, there was one where uh, <laughs> um, where uh, George George uh, is supposed to move. They're, they're going to have a yard sale, and he's supposed oh, to yeah. move all the stuff out from a, of a house out into the yard where people can come and look at the stuff and buy it. You know, and he finds it very tedious to have to carry all this stuff. You know, he's just a little monkey, you know. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And he yeah. discovers by accident that the, the whole idea of a lever that he, he, he sits on an ironing board and the iron goes flying and he realizes, <laughs> oh, wow. And so he sets up a, a, a sort of catapult and starts f hurling stuff out of the house you know, out into the yard. Mm -hmm. Of course, that <laughs> causes mayhem. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So how would you how would you compare writing for a children's series like Curious George to writing for a series for a slightly older demographic like Chalk Zone? Um, for me, the... Uh, the joy of writing for the older group because I can be much more uh, let my imagination and my molecules float free, you know, and come up with really crazy stuff. And it isn't, uh, you know, we, that one that I just said, you know, that caused much consternation because they were afraid that the kids would see it and would start, you know, catapulting things out of their window, you know. And, yeah. And right. um, yeah. Uh, so you were you were constantly grappling with that kind of, uh, which is really, you know, at first it's kind of an interesting challenge, and then it's like, this is tedious. I have to figure out 
you know, because humor lies in, uh, you know, danger, really. It lies in, in calamity. <laughs> yeah. You know, really, I mean, what do we think is funny is in our own lives is when we uh, right. don't, don't realize that the glass door is closed and we walk into it thinking that it's uh, it's open, you know, and, you know, break our nose or break the glass, you know, I mean, it's, you know, that's after the, the calamity, it's funny. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. So we talked about a lot of your work in the past. Can you share any projects you're working on now? Now? Yeah. Is there oh, anything no. you're working on now you can oh. share with us? Yeah, I'm working on two novels. Uh, oh, both nice. Science fiction. Awesome. Uh, one is much farther along than the other. It's a. It's about a. Um, uh, a discovery of a new form of renewable energy which is human emotions uh that 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 they can be captured when people get uh have any emotion you know uh it can be captured and like solar power like capturing photons and making them into uh energy um but of course the single biggest uh uh outpouring of human emotion is sex yeah and, uh, so it kind of explores what happens when the entire culture ch changes into a sex power grid you know mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, uh, it's coming quite well I'm uh, nice. I'm pleased nice. with it it's an exciting it's kind of like Brave New World, you know? Yeah, yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be looking forward to that. Yeah, awesome to hear. Um, so what do you enjoy most about your work today? What I'm doing today? No, what do you enjoy most about your work? No, no, he yeah. said, he said, he asked, so what, what do you enjoy most about your work today? Uh, hey, I've always, I, I, enjoy the same thing that i enjoyed when i was six years old you know oh wow i mean it's really quite amazing to work on creative projects mm -hmm. particularly yeah. songs you know songs are amazing because um, exactly something uh, something didn't exist and then you work on it and it, be it becomes a song and now mm -hmm. there's this incredible new thing in the world that wasn't wasn't there yesterday yeah, well, I wasn't there even 15 minutes ago, and <laughs> uh, it's astonishing, you know. And regardless of how successful that song is, it's there; it exists, you know. And same is true mm -hmm. with writing a story. You're writing, you're writing along, and you make up a character. That character didn't exist 10 minutes ago. Now you got, you know, Mrs. McGillicuddy coming in, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's. It's great. It's thrilling. Yeah. That's awesome. Nice. Exactly. Very nice. So as a creator and a writer, what challenges would you say you faced during your career? Well, one that I face that most people don't is, uh, is I do a lot of things. Um, yeah. I do more things at a pretty high level at a, at a, you know, where it's plausible to be professional at this, then, you know, I, I, I can, I'm a writer, I'm a songwriter, I'm a singer, I'm an actor, you know, uh, I'm a, uh, and I can also be kind of a executive. I can, you know, work out marketing plans and stuff like that. So it, it's, it's, that is a blessing and a curse. You know, people who just do one thing and do that one thing really well, and that's what people look to them for. Yeah. Have it a little bit easier just because 
you're not constantly thinking, oh, well, now I've got, I, I could be writing a song, but I, uh, I got to write this, uh, this, you know, script or this, you know, uh, and, and a lot of times people don't accept it, particularly when I was the VP creative director at Hanna-Barbera and started yeah. doing creative things like writing songs, you know, writing the theme song to uh, Cave Kids. Oh, yeah, I know about that. Yeah. I haven't seen yeah. it. Yeah, it's, it was a show uh, featuring uh, the kids, you know. Yeah, Bam, Pebbles and Bam Bam. Bam and uh, Pebbles. Pebbles and, yeah. and, uh, and I wrote uh, a marketing piece of music uh, that for that uh, line of items, and everybody loved that. So that became the theme song for the show. And then I wrote a couple of songs. I wasn't supposed to be writing the songs. And the people who were making the show said, oh, we really like Bill's songs. But the people who were producing the show said, no, we, we can't have Bill Burnett be the writer of the songs for this show. You know, he's not a songwriter. He's the creative director here. You know, what the, he's a suit. You know, what is he doing in here? So that was something that I had to overcome. And it's that type of problem I've had many, many times in my life, of, uh, you know, just that's awesome. Yeah. 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 So what piece of advice would you give to anyone who wants to get into writing or producing or even creating their own project? Well, first of all, do it, <laughs> whatever it is, find a way to do it as much as you possibly can, you know, and, um, in this day and age, it's it's quite plausible to uh, if you're writing songs, get a, get logic or or something. It's not difficult. It's it's a learning curve, but it's not difficult. And learn to play enough so that you can at least make demos mm -hmm. that sound good of your songs. And if it's a you know, find a way to get it as close to. Um, executed as possible and that way at least you have something you know if you're if you're trying to uh to get the gatekeepers to allow you to come in and work for disney or allow mm -hmm. you to you know write a script of something it's a very hard climb you know but uh, but if you have something and, you know, sometimes this can be trickery, you know, you can, uh, for instance, if you have something, if you have an idea that uh, that can be made into a book, you know, there are ways to make books look fully published. Mm -hmm. We're not too much money. You know, if you if you have the way to lay out the. Uh, and I could I could tell your audience, I mean, Affinity is a really great series of programs, you know, Affinity Photo, Affinity Design, uh -huh. and Affinity Publisher. They, they are put together, they are pretty much as powerful as Photoshop. And Photoshop is, uh, is a subscription-based thing that charges you like $250 a year. You know, oh boy. Affinity is is for each of those things costs about fifty bucks. So for one hundred and fifty dollars, you could have pretty much all the power of Photoshop, and it will be improved. And you know, they will make improve. You know, it's not going to just sit there. Yeah. Uh, and um, and it's really great. Uh, and and then you can send it away to you can set it up. You can do all the things that you need to do to make a book. You know, lay the type out mm -hmm. in, in a nice way, put in illustrations, put in pictures, whatever it is you want to do. And then you can get a hardbound book. And then you can even put it on Amazon and sell it. And, yeah. And uh, and then you can go to the, the, the big powers and say, would you like to uh, option this book? instead of uh instead of going and saying 
I have this idea. Would you like to make this idea for your gigantic company? Would you like to put $20 million behind this idea? Now, would, would you like to option this book? You know, it's a different mindset. You'll be given different people to talk to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, you know, fans of Chalk Zone, what, what, what would you like to say to the fans and supporters of Chalk Zone and the rest of your work? Write to Nickelodeon and uh, tell them how much you would like to see a reboot of Chalk Zone in some form. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. I like like a uh, a limited series or a, uh, a a special movie. Yeah, yeah, a movie would be cool with the idea that you said they you never explored. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I think it yeah, would work. Good. And I think there's yeah. more than enough, uh, you know, public interest in uh, in Chalk Zone. I mean, you go to sites about Chalk Zone. Yeah, and uh, it's like three million views. You know, I mean, it's there's mm. a lot of people uh-huh. who care about chalk zone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely, and, absolutely. So, if people would like to contact you. Where can people find you? Hmm. Uh, let's see. Uh, I guess you know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I I I, I don't want to uh, open some kind of floodgate. Um, uh, you can just you know uh, Google Bill Burnett, and several places will come up. And you know, I, I get a lot of messages through an old website that I I'm thinking of maybe re revitalizing it was it's called bill burnett song mine.com it's yeah. uh, one one word bill burnett song mine uh and uh what you can do there uh, i used to replenish that every week with uh videos and songs and articles that i wrote and stuff and then i just said uh i'm you know, things like that get to be a burden. So <laughs> I, uh, I stopped doing it, but it still exists there. And every so often I get a message through there. And that serves as a kind of a nice um, uh, what firewall kind of thing, because a person has to go there and write a message on Squarespace. And then I get the message. And if I want, if this sounds like it's in, it interests me and I and it's not going to be a stalker or something, I can respond without necessarily revealing my whereabouts. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're also on Twitter. Yeah, I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook. Thank you. You're uh, everywhere. We'll put links in the description for people to find you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Website. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, when you think of nostalgia, what do you oh, think nostalgia. of? How would you define nostalgia? That's interesting that you asked that. We were just discussing nostalgia. Um, some people say that nostalgia is a low-grade depression. You know that uh, uh-huh. you know you you feel kind of sad. That you know you, you the feeling that you have it's a, it is a but um, I don't know. I think there's always something um, bittersweet about things that we have gone through that mattered to us one way or another. And, you know, that song, that show, that girl, that friend uh, that we can't possibly get back to. Sometimes it's bridges that we've burned that we're responsible for that dissolution and other times it's just the way life rolls you know you just yeah. um and uh there you go you know yeah mm-hmm. yeah definitely and of course chalk zone i mean that's nostalgic definitely nostalgic sure, yeah. to me for sure same mm-hmm. yeah 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 for uh you know 
Well, thank you so much for you being on, um, Bill, and it was a pleasure for, for finally doing this, and keep up yeah. the great work, and can we what's what's happening next to you. Hopefully you come back on in the future. We have more people from Chalk Zone with you. Yeah. Not like EG or someone. Yeah, sure. or Candy. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't... Yep. Any other voices? Anyway, what, Jakey, is, what is the name of this uh, this entity that is talking to me right now? That you guys. What do you uh, call yourselves? Uh, like, what's the name of the podcast? Or yeah, or you, uh, you know, your Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Excuse me. J- it's called a uh, Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Oh, Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, well, anyway, so that with that being said, everyone, that brings another episode of Jake's Happiness Nostalgia Show to a close. Uh, Bill, you know, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for being a guest. Uh, you are worth it for sure. Mm-hmm. Yes. No, this was great fun, guys. I yes, hopefully we can have you back you. on in the future. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, and for those who don't know, I don't know if you can still find it now, but I did interview Bill on another podcast years ago called the DJ Bob Show. Yep. Really? Yes. Great friend of ours, DJ Bob. Great friend yeah, of ours. Yes. Yes. Uh, a lot of those earlier interviews you can no longer find, unfortunately. But yeah, mm-hmm. it, it was a fun interview. But anyway, so yeah. from all of us to all of you. We love remember, you, Bob. <laughs> You're yes. worth it, yes. Remember, You're you worth are it. worth it. It's always staying nostalgic. Bye bye, everybody. You're worth Bye-bye. it. Bye-bye. You're worth it. Bye. See you next time on another episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. Be sure to follow us on social media and stream us wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember that you are worth it and to always stay nostalgic. Bye-bye.